I'll tell you from the very beginning, if I reflect back, I always liked working with my hands, making, you know, in our days, there used to be mechanos, which is uh, Lego now. And if anybody asked me, what do you want for your birthday? It would be the next mechano, next uh, step further. So I knew, this is a reflection now that I love to work with my hands. And I was born left-handed, but in those days, left-handed was considered bad luck. So my Hindi tutor broke my knuckles and converted me into right-handed. And my, my handwriting went to pot. I mean, I sometimes have difficulty reading my own handwriting even now, but, but that's typical of doctors. They, they like to scribble anyway. But let's park it for that. I hated everybody for having allowed that my knuckles to be broken and my hands to be shifted because this whole myth of left-handed is, is, uh, is unlucky was anathema to me. Anyway, we move forward. And like every child, I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to do this, but whatever. My both my parents were doctors, and both of them we were we were displaced from Pakistan. So there was a three-room uh, uh, apartment or a, a flat we got in Connaught Place. So we used to be living like in one in one room, four of us: my sister, me, and my parents. And my mother and my father used to practice in the other two rooms. So one was an ENT surgeon, the other was an obstetric gynecologist. So. We had from the age, I mean, as to, from living memory, just this interaction with patients coming in and misery and going happy and all that. So I think somewhere in my DNA, it, it was that I would become a doctor, but it was fashionable. It was then, and I hope it's fashionable now. You always did the opposite of what your parents tell you. So my <laughs> father said, don't become a doctor. You, you, you get no time to yourself. You'll be sweating and you don't, you know, all that, all that spiel. And I decided the more he discouraged me, the more I wanted to be a doctor. So that was the first stubbornness that, that came. I identified myself. Okay. Then I fortunately went to King George's Medical College, Lucknow. And over there, we were it was excellent theoretical and practical education. But one thing that was missing, and we, I discovered it, the kicker came on one night. The one night kicker was... We, I'm taking care of a patient who's got a, one of the valves, mitral valves, is blocked. The blood is not going through. The fluid is collecting throughout her body. Her belly was bloated. We put a catheter in her belly and trying to put the fluid back into the heart. I mean, and we used to have a four-hour rotation with a little pump like that. We just rotated all night by, by uh, a, a turn and the patient would die. That was the thing that we knew what the disease was and we did not know how to fix it. Young girl, ladies were dying, young men were dying from this disease. India had very high incidence of, of rheumatic heart disease. But at the same time, when we were reading journals, we knew that in the US, the treatment had already started. There was operations now designed, although at that time, the, the death rate from those operations was 50%, but it had started. That's when... That night I decided, I'm going to go learn what I can and come back to India. This is just an innocent thought of a young doctor. I mean, it may or may not have had any reality, but this was the, the first light that came to my head that this is what I want to do. So this, that's that one night that decided that this is the journey I want to take. I want to be learn everything there is, bring it back to India and apply it to as many people as I can. Okay. So then... You know, basically what it meant was that at least I saw some pathway for myself. Then there is a, another very big realization that there is no such thing as brilliant or genius. These are all, it's, it's not something that, that anybody possesses. It is a set of circumstances that come your way, opportunities that I, I'm not, I, you know, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in it all, I'm spiritual, but the, I'm, I'm kind of neutral in this whole field. But those opportunities do drop. And there is something, some force in the world that gives you that opportunity. If you can take it, if you can grab it, you can then ride on it. And 
it, at every turn, if help comes and you don't recognize it, then of course you missed it. But if you recognize it, it helps you to go where you want to go. So it's like a radar of your, your personal radar. So what happened? I got a job in Philadelphia, King, Thomas Jefferson University, as my, because I wrote to 50 universities, I got this job from there. Anyway, that was one of the centers why I chose because it had heart surgery. There were not more than 15, 20 centers in the, in the whole of the United States that were doing heart surgery at that time. I saw the drama of this whole, it was amazing, it'll take a long time to describe it, but I'll tell you, I, I, had, I was in a general surgery program, I went to my chief and I asked him, I said, who's the best teacher of heart surgery in the US or the, in the world by that time, because it's only the US where heart surgery had started. So he's, it came out, Frank Spencer at New York University. But why do you ask? He has a five-year waiting list and he doesn't speak to foreigners. If I swear, if he had not said the last sentence, life would have been different. I just latched onto that, went home, wrote a letter to Spencer saying that I come from India. I had wanted, I, I, you know, there are people are dying there. I want to learn everything. I want to go back to India. But I suppose it's all futile because you don't speak to foreigners. So that must have hit him because it's like I called him a bigot, which was unknowingly, but I had. So he wrote promptly back. He said, no, that's not true. I love foreigners. <laughs> so the whole thing, right? So if that whole sentence, if I hadn't caught on in my head, I, I wouldn't have. So then he said, look, there are 32 jobs as, as a starting because in, the, in those days, it used to be a pyramidal system. 32 used to start. Four would become chief residents and only two would go to become heart surgeons. So he said, 31 are taken from our own medical college in Harvard, which we have a collaboration with. There is one slot open. You can compete for that. So luckily, the guy who interviewed me asked me the question, which was the, my, my uh, like most curiosity. I read the Bible on it and that got me that job anyway. So then it went the pyramid and all that stuff. I became, then they asked me to join the faculty. Now I had arrived as a heart surgeon. I was practicing in New York as, as at New York University on my own alma mater. The point was how to get to India. India, that's when the whole journey started. I finished, I, I, I finished my board in 79 and I started looking. So that's when again, opportunity came. One day, Mr. Hari Nanda was was, had come to New York. He knew my parents and all. He says, Nanesh, uh, I'd like to see uh, your hospital and your and, and surgery also. So him and his son, I, I took him on a tour. And while we were going through the operating rooms, one, one of my seniors had, was having problems with the heart surgery coming off pump, which is what we do to, to repair the heart. He was having trouble coming off. And then I just made a suggestion which, work, which worked. And that seemed to, to go straight to Mr. Nanda and says, look, if you're teaching your, your superiors, I want you back in India right now. Let's, let's make something. I also want to do something for India. That's when the journey started. Then we couldn't stand, find lands. I mean, health came in many ways. It'll take a full year to talk about it. But that's when, when a patient was had to be operated on. Uh, it just... I'll, I'll give you that. I think it's, it's important to fill this gap. So one day I got a call. I was in New York. Ramesh Bhandari was foreign secretary. He had come to the UN for, uh, for the session. He called me up and says, Naresh, he, he used to speak like this. He said, Naresh, Pistra Bando. I said, why? He said, we are going to Delhi. I said, why? He said, a very close associate of Mrs. Gandhi needs has had a heart attack. You need to do a bypass. Nobody knows how to do a bypass. You come with me. And I said, where will I operate in, in, in India? He said, no, no, All India Institute is available. You do what you have to do. So we got onto the plane. We arrived here. I was a state guest because this was like a associate here. So with sirens blowing, I go to Panth Hospital. And over there we find the patient is on the ground. They are giving him his last, last rites, uh, Tulsi and Ganga Jal and all that. That was the second turning point in my life, from which was like... Divine, you should get a call, whatever. I now you can imagine my my predicament is a big surgeon come from in, from US to save somebody's life and the guy's gone. 
So I just felt his pulse. He was still beating at 40 beats a minute and you could barely feel his pressure. So I asked the chief over there, I said, do you have a pacemaker? I put it in, I turned it up to 90, his heartbeats. And this guy started waking up. He woke up. And then the family tried to pull the tulsi out of his mouth and all that. It was like a drama which is still very clear in my head. Anyway, then we realized when we did his echo that his heart was functioning only 20% and there was no way you could be done in, in India. So we flew him back to New York. I operated on him. He has survived. He came back and went to see Mrs. Gandhi with his traditional uh, fistful of roses. And she said to him, she said, oh, she said, Hare, you're still alive. I thought I, I was told you're dead. So that's when she said, when Dr. Trihan comes to India, please bring him to me. That's how the journey started back because when I, took, I gave her the whole spiel, she said, what do you need? I said, we need a piece of land and she made it possible. So that was the starting point of the return journey. Then Escort Heart Institute of History, six years later, we, I built it from ground up and I returned at that time. Now, two th from this is now 88, now, now we are 2003. We have created the finest heart institute in, you can comparable to anybody in the world, but no, no, that was not the important. I we helped more than 100 uh, other hospitals to develop heart institutes. We trained 200 cardiologists, 100 surgeons in the in those 18, 20 years that I was there. But in 2003, it became very clear to me one thing that we. India was, when I was growing up, was called a developing country or underdeveloped country, sorry, then developing country, then almost developed and suddenly in 2003 it began an emerging market. So puzzling I felt that look, they don't call us India because we are copycats. We are master copycats, including me. I went and learned something. I may have done many things when I've come back and maybe evolved it for India, but otherwise the origin is copycat. And the origin lies in about 10, 12 institutes around the world. May it be the Harvards and the John Hopkins and the Mayos and the uh, Cleveland Clinics of the World, Imperial College, you know, that kind of institution. So that's when I said, if India is to be master of its own destiny, we need to create our own version of these institutions. That was the thought with which the concept of building Vedanta started. So this was in my head. And then, then again, it's history. I mean, this land was there and, you know, whatever, whatever, I'll tell you another day. But the point is, that was the kicker. So I, it's not like I had planned that I was such a, you know, evolved person that from day one to I wanted to do this or do that. These are things that happened. And then, fortunately, uh, a pair of, a couple of guys bought Vedanta, not Vedanta, sorry, escorts and kicked me on my ass, threw me out. That was the best thing that happened. Because if it, that not, if it not happened, I was trying to do both things, work at escorts and try to create Medanta. So it would have never seen the light of the save for another half a dozen years. So the fact that they came and in their wisdom thought that they need to get rid of me, that was a great boom. At that time, it seemed like the heavens had fallen. But I'll tell you one thing. This is a friend of ours. When he first saw it on TV, he called me up and he said, look, don't be discouraged. And I, I would say to all your students, says the storm that is coming and he's talking, this, uh, this uh, poet is talking to the eagle. He says, the storm that is coming is not to destroy you. It is com coming to make you fly higher. Those things still stick in my, in Urdu, it's, it's, it's very beautiful. The couplet is very beautiful when the way he recited it. But the point really is it's true. If it had not happened, Medanta would not have happened the way it is. And now Medanta has happened and fortunately the rules have changed because my, my mission has always been to, the, I, I under, why, I, where, why Medanta, I said, I told you. But the whole thing was to create a medical college or what we call medical school in American parlance of the new generation. Because medical education is very good in India, but it lacks certain things on, on humanities, on relationships. 
And if you look at it, and if anybody is, is fond of reading scriptures, Gita has the full lesson, the, 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 the interaction between Krishna and Arjun is basically tells you how a patient needs to be taken care of. How those five elements that are accompanying a patient. So we look at it as traditionally as doctors, as somebody who's got cancer, he's just got cancer. So let's address the cancer. That's not what he's coming to you for alone. He's carrying a huge baggage. And the anxiety about himself, whether, whether he's going to be living, pain, financial, family, the whole baggage. And unless you can address the whole baggage, you cannot be a good doctor and you cannot heal your patients the way you should. So these are lessons to learn in life. So that's why I say now that we have arrived, the journey hopefully, I mean, my incomplete journey was to make the medical college and that's what I was telling you. The rules have finally been changed. 31st of October, the new National Medical Commission came into being and issued the, the new uh, requirements and the fact that private hospitals can own medical colleges. This is what I wanted. Because otherwise, when you do it in a trust, you know, people were surviving by taking capitation fee, all this. We didn't know, I don't want to indulge in all that. So that's, that's what we are doing right now. So hopefully, before I fade, I will have built it and have the pleasure of having something like your, you are, the proud, proud creators of a university. I think that's a great, great end to a journey. I think, you know, to, to spare that. So that's my personal thing. Now tell me whatever time is left, I will so, give you. So I think we do, uh, I'm sure there'll be many, many questions that I would have gone on a little, but uh, I think you have given some really good and simple insight, which you just narrated as a story. But I, I can clearly so, so see one, that. One thing I forgot, uh, so, sorry to interrupt you. That very tragedy that has happened in my life that they converted me from left to right handed. The day I did my first surgery, I realized I could operate with both my hands. <laughs> so that was the biggest blessing. In fact, I went back to the tutor when I came from US to, to visit India. I went with all these gifts to him to say, thank you. I was cursing you all my life that the, you could see surgeons bending themselves up and down, trying to get stitches in. And I could just switch hands and keep moving. So, so that was a great, great blessing how it happened. But anyway, it all goes back to the same thing that things happen in your life which you don't, you had nothing to do with and you can't claim that you were so brilliant. It's just the matter that you got blessed along the way. Sorry about that. Well, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we obviously can say that you got blessed, but I think you have to take more credit than that because clearly a couple of things came in, Vijay, after that we opened for questions. One is that you are curiously looking around as you talked of a radar or whatever is happening. And to you, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad, but something is happening. Number one. Number two, you took initiative. You did write to that fellow that, and you knew how to give you a message and you don't talk to foreigners. So you took the initiative to hit where it really hit hard when the opportunity was there. And third, I think it is fascinating is that every disadvantage, every adversity, you have worked at making it work for you. Someone could have said, I don't have a right hand, so I'm now, I'll give up. No, you saw it, you had two hands. So each of the adversities, when they, if you had to go from escort, you said, fantastic, now I'm free. So I think that mindset is unique and that perhaps is the lesson from your story, which you will keep thanking the Lord for, but I guess the Lord helped those who helped themselves an old saying. No, so no, no. There is an addition to that. Along the way, if you have sincerity of thought, you will earn so much goodwill that no matter what trouble you get into, the goodwill will float you back up. That's a lesson that I've learned hugely in my life. 